everyone to another episode of HR Imperial 2.0. I'm Pete Tiliakis, and as always, I'm joined by the legendary Julie Fernandez. Welcome, Julie. Thanks, Pete. Great to hear you this week. Yes, yes. And uh, we are joined by a very special guest this week. I'm so excited to have Anne-Marie V, as I call her, Anne-Marie Verweyen, <laughs> Global Head of Payroll Services for S&P Global, a longtime payroll executive and a new member of our 360 Insights Executive Council that we have focused specifically around payroll. So welcome, Anne-Marie. Thank you, Pete. Hi, Julie. Nice to be part of this podcast. Great to have you, Henry. Yeah, thank you. We're, we're really happy to have you. Um, I'm, I First, I want to say thank you. I know as a payroll leader, uh, right now is not the best time to be um, hanging out. Uh, I'm, sure you, I'm sure you have a million things on your plate. I, I, tr- I reshared a post this morning about the fact that payroll um, is often the, the group in, in, in the back office that is not getting the week off whenever everyone else is sort of uh, celebrating the holiday. So thank you for what you do. The next few weeks even, right? It trickles right on into January. Yeah, well, I was going to say, it's not just this week, but yeah. But thank you, Emery. I really appreciate you taking the time. So look, uh, we, Emery, we start every, uh, every show we do um, with this same question, right? We ask our guests, how did you end up in payroll? And more importantly, why do you stick around and stay with it? Great question, and I I had to laugh when you said why do you stay. So I'll I'll <laughs> start with how I ended up in payroll. I always knew I wanted to be in an office job, um, and my first job was at a butcher's accounting company, and the butchers came in with their sticky notes, and you can imagine that like they were not like clean. Like the, the meat and the blood were still on the receipts and I had to code it and I had to write out the pay stubs. So it's always been part of my role, but I wasn't really specific on payroll till I switched jobs and I got to do payroll for 108 people. I never forget that. And at that point I was like, 108 people? How do I do that? Now, when you're more seasoned, you go like, eh, 108. Um, but that was a big deal. And that is when I realized that that was my passion. I like the accuracy. I like the stress of making sure that everything gets done on time. And I'm very proud to make sure that everybody gets paid because everybody works for their pay. And my job takes away any stress or any hardship because I want to do my job right. Wow. A butcher shop. I have so many questions. Yeah. (laughs) And and I'm so excited because I'm pretty positive that Anne-Marie is the first person that has told us in their personal story that I really like this dress. And I'm I'm glad, right? Obviously, there's a lot of people that don't like that about Global Payroll, but I can relate to that because when you have so much on your plate or, you know, you have these these deadlines, like all of a sudden it's imperative and you get so much more done. You like go into super productivity mode, right? I, I am at my best. If I have too much to do, too many deadlines, that's when I thrive. And sometimes I wonder, like, why are you doing this? But that's kind of tied into why did I stay? Well, I did something different for two years. I I led a global mobility team, which I liked, but it made me realize it's not the same. The constant change the legislative changes, the education within the company, the impact that you have as a payroll person, but also the natural curiosity to know everything I want to know about payroll. And I honestly, I ran most payrolls myself as well when I, you know, climbed the payroll ladder. That's why I stayed, because it's never boring. There's an M&A or a legislative change or something happens that make you, you know, instantly go into your your superhero mode, and that's why I stay in payroll. It, it's true. I I think back to when I was uh, when I was in payroll. I mean, even when it was at the the craziest moments, you know, it was refreshing to not come in. You think like, oh, it's so monotonous, but it really isn't the same day every day. It's a it's actually a different challenge every day. Looking back, I think my brain was attracted to that. You know what I mean? Like the the the, the shuffle of things being exciting all the time. So, well, congratulations and thank you for thank you for sticking around. I was just thinking, like dun dun dun, we need to change our <laughs> our, our intro music. <laughs> I know, I know, but you know, Emery, you said something there I, that I want to talk about a minute. Yeah. Is education. I, I've been I've been seeing lately, anecdotally, in conversations on in posts online 
about leaders sort of communicating the lack of education that there is for global payroll, especially at the country level. Um, and I think that the big associations like the GPA and the, the GPMI and certainly the payroll org, which is, you know, uh, the, the, the mothership of, of the GPMI, they do a great job. But are is that enough? Do you think that there's a gap in education right now? I mean, we certainly aren't getting it's not like we all took a payroll 101 in college. Um, most of us had no idea that was even a job. Um, and so what do you think? Do you think there's enough education? There's not. Um, I think there there is education. And I'm, I'm glad with all the organizations you just mentioned, because they, it gives you a baseline. But there's so much more to it than what you learn with these organizations, like your collective bargaining agreements, uh, how do you deal with the tax offices? How do you deal with negotiations? Those all come on top of your, your basic payroll. And I'm, I'm a little bit in the middle here because I also realize that people seem to lose their curiosity a little bit. Like, as I said before, I ran all the payrolls myself. Um, sometimes because I had no other choice. It was either that or nobody got paid. Yeah. And I, I certainly didn't, you know, I never will say that I did everything 100% right, but I definitely gave it my best shot. But, you know, when I don't know something, I'll go out and I try to find the answer. And the answer is not always there. And then how do you get to the answer? And what I see with people who are just starting their journey is they seem to not know where to go. They they seem to look for answers with like the GPA or, or the other organizations, but the hunger to go out, go out and try to find it yourself, um, that is something that is changing. And I think, you know, with the bots and all the technology, that's probably part of it. But I would love to see a payroll education that, yes, focuses on the countries, but also on what else is there in payroll. And I mentioned like your negotiation skills, your vendor management, how do you deal with external agencies, finance, how do you get a seat at the table? And I think that part is more missing than the countries itself. That's a great point. It's almost like a leadership development specifically for right. the payroll role. Yeah. yeah. I feel like there's a little bit of a hands-on element, right? I mean, it's easy to see when you have uh, folks that are oriented toward the trades versus toward an office job. And Emory, you started saying you knew you always wanted to work in an office. And that type of curiosity to me just feels like that's the hands-on. That's the person that wants to touch it and feel it and own it. And there's a million places to do that in payroll, especially when you start talking yep. global payroll. And so maybe that's, that's like our white collar, you know, um, trades curiosity, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But where you could, we could be our own little, uh, Mike, Mike Rowe, I think it is right. He, <laughs> the uh, dirty jobs guy is always out there yeah. promoting the trades and, and he's right. Right. It's a, we need to do that. I think. And I, I think more people need to be more, more people who I think are focused on a career in HR should really try to start that in payroll, in my opinion. I think it's such a great baseline place to begin understanding how it all works, um, that you can learn tremendous skills uh, to take you on to a better career, you know, a bigger career in HR if you want. And you just gave me a great idea. Like, how cool would it be if, if some of my leadership would sit with the payroll team for a week or two and experience, yeah. like Mike Rowe, what they're actually doing? Oh, yeah. Huh. Yeah. Thank you for that. I like that. <laughs> yeah. I love the idea of executives just be, I think to be a senior executive, you really should have had to spend some time in HR. I mean, maybe not payroll, but at least HR. We, we might be able to maybe uh, bring some people into that whole realm and to your idea, Anne-Marie, if we're just thinking about all the hype around career pathing, right? I mean, if we could just, you know, insert maybe some insertion of that as a core competency for career pathing anywhere in HR and, and even yeah. in finance, that, that would make sense to a lot of us who, who know payroll. Yeah, you know, and just to be, just to be fair, like where I learned that idea of executives having to work in HR in order to become senior executives, I got that from the Marines. It's always really? been that way, right? In order to be a Marine at any, to, to rise in the ranks into senior leadership, 
you have to, especially as an enlisted man or woman, you have to either take a drill instructor path or a recruiter path at some point in your career, which means you either have to do recruiting or development of the Marine. And it's tremendous, right? I think you have a totally different understanding and respect for human capital and, and, the, and the power and the, uh, you know, the quality of what that means to your culture. Um, that I think is, is very different when you've had a life where you've never been exposed to that as an executive. So I'd love to see more doing that, more companies Me too. do that. Yeah. Exactly. So look, Anne-Marie, as we're here in the waning hours of, of 2023, and again, I know you're, you're very busy, right, with your team, with your end. What's been 2023 for, for your organization and what are you guys uh, looking at and excited about for 2024? What are you focused on? Yeah, so it was my first year at SMP and it's been a really good year. It's a, it's a very cool company to work for and I has there because I don't want this to be about SMP but like what I've learned is like they really think about their employees and it's people first that yeah. was really new for me but for payroll specifically it's been a year of change so we had two years ago we we had a merger we had IHSM market and SMP merge so we really had to bring two teams together to one team and for me, it was building a new team. And it doesn't mean everybody that I brought in is new, but it's a new way of working, a new team, new roles and responsibilities. And we actually build a career path within payroll. We're not perfect yet, but we have the payroll operational teams and then we have a, a, a global operational support structure. So it means that if people want to try something else, besides operational payroll, in the past, the only option was to to leave payroll and do something different. Now they can choose to go into payroll project management. They can go into process improvement, Kaizen's, robotics. They can go into compliance governance. We have um, one of our, our people leads like the workday coding technology side of things. And that is super exciting. And I see it, it took a little bit of time, but I now see people displaying an interest in trying something else in payroll. And I think, as you mentioned in the Marines, it's key for your growth that you have more knowledge and experience than just running a payroll. So I'm super excited yeah. that we got that done. And then for 2024, we're we're looking at harmonizing our, our payroll vendor landscape. We have too many payroll vendors. At the same time, we're also improving our reporting capabilities, like metrics. We made a great start in 2023. We have plenty of things we can report on that we don't do yet. And then also thinking about what artificial intelligence can do for us and how we can use RPA for for some of the repetitive tasks. Um, very exciting, very challenging, a lot of change, but I think it's for the better. Yeah, no, I, I think that's great. I, congratulations. And I, I love that, that point you made about the career pathing. I, I think back about uh, during my career, I had a couple of really, really great leaders that I worked uh, with. I either helped them with transformation or was actually working for them. Um, in very big, big companies. And they were folks who had come from a different lens in the organization, but had done uh, come over into payroll or shared services type environments as a promotional path um, and made some incredible impacts and probably never would have thought about that had that not been the opportunity for them. So that's a great way, right? We have to figure out somehow how to get other skills into payroll. And I think it could be very refreshing for, yeah. for both parties. And and what I want to mention as well, so so my current leader, Seth, he has an IT background and it's yeah. such a blessing to I have bet. a passionate leader who is all about technology and, and process improvement and, and digitalization. It's the first time I, I have a leader with an IT background and it's, it fits like a glove. It's such a good match. Yeah, that that is that's a great great resource. Uh, congratulations, that's a that's like a digital partner, right? Yeah. Digital champion. Yeah. But I can't help but call out. You, you know, you started by saying, and there's such a people focus at S and P yeah. and in your area and in your environment. And you know, I think that doesn't always happen with an IT leadership over payroll. So that just sounds really cool. 
Well, and, you know, Seth is my leader. He leads the people experience team. And Dimitra is the, 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 the purpose leader, as we call it. Very strong focus on people. And, you know, I can see that they practice what they preach. And sometimes, like with all companies, sometimes, you know, decisions are hard and don't always, it's not always like happy decisions, but you know, this company is the first where I really feel people come first. And I think that is, that is great. That's great that they walk the walk, right? They're not yeah, or walk exactly. the talk, right? They're yeah. not just, they're not just sort of saying it. And, and, you know, the, 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 this is a very interesting topic and, and shameless plug here, but we've done a to- an episode on this about, you know, having that executive, that senior level air cover who is invested in helping champion payroll or an organization that is championing payroll as part of their culture is so, so helpful in you getting things done and actually improving and moving forward more so, I think, than maybe even money on the table being, you know, investing. And so, uh, yeah, that, that's that's great to hear that you have that partner, uh, Amory. I think it's a huge help. I, I do want to see you bring up a really good point, like, but I have to say it starts with visibility. And I think we'll get into that a little bit later. Yeah. But like you can have all the leadership you want if you don't help them understand what your world is about. You know, there's not a lot they can do because you, you need visibility and, and data to help them understand what your journey is and what your like your yeah. roadblocks are. Yeah, no, you're right. And that's, that's key to, to you actually sort of partnering with them, I think. And, and we are, I do want to get into that a little bit here, but I want to ask you, Amory, just a bit about like, just looking, you've been in payroll for a long time, right? From the yeah. butcher shop to, to Wall Street now. I mean, what a rise, right? I mean, it's a, be- it's a beautiful story. And what, I mean, like, but what's changed, right? Like, like you've come a long way from, from ticking and tying to, to now having a, a digital partner helping you modernize your organization. What, What's it been like, like over the years and how you think it's changing? You know, I can easily say that what changed is when I started my career, payroll was all about data entry. And honestly, like if I entered 3000 variables in an hour, I felt I accomplished something, you know, it. we didn't know any better. And what I've seen is like, it's shifting where you now have payroll partners who, who have technology it's moving from Excel to seriously digitalization of the payroll. The role is changing from a payroll data entry stigma, I would say, that, that payroll has to really being an analyst and an automation partner for the company. We, we still have a long way to go and, you know, the the artificial intelligence, it's its just early days. Um, and I also realized that not everybody has a large budget. I also not always had a large budget, but we, even without the budget, there's so much you can do with efficiency and automation. And that's what I learned along the way is the different companies taught me different things. Um, Amazon l- showed me Kaizen, Greenbelt, Black Belt. Other organizations showed me vendor management and leadership skills and all wrapped together. I think that's where, where, why I am here now. But I'm also like, if, if payroll is changing, you have to be willing to, to ride the wave change because yeah. it's not going to stop. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, you, I, I think that, the, you know, you just l- listed a bunch of skills that you've picked up along the way. That's the stuff that I don't think people understand about payroll, yeah. th- th- especially in a big organization, right? There, M&A is hard. Uh, b- you know, broad org redesigns are hard. Um, compensation cycles and benefits enrollments are hard and they trickle down to payroll and payroll has to be very helpful and involved in that. And um, you need a lot of skills to be able to do that. Vendor management, project management, change management. Um, all the managements, right? Most uh, important so, <laughs> skill is to say yeah. no, but yes. because everything, as you say, everything trickles down to payroll and yeah. payroll. I, with all the love in my voice, always call payroll the dustbin of everything else because we roll up our sleeves and get it done yep. where we 100%. really need to start say, listen, I can't do it now, but I can do it next week or the week after. And that is tough because in your payroll blood, 
you get things done. You make the impossible possible. But saying no, I still struggle with that sometimes yes. too. This is where the art and science comes in, right? The diplomacy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Another skill you got to have to make it in payroll. But yeah, no, it's great. But but we need people to know this. I think we need executives to understand what what you know. We 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 laugh and sit, make these cliche statements about payroll being magic and being magic, magicians. But there's a lot of lifting that goes into that, and it's some of it's unnecessary. And yeah, I'd, I'd love to see it the attitude change because I think there's so much value that's not being unlocked in payroll right now. Then you mentioned that right from the beginning, you know, the stigma that payroll is about data entry. And I think that's the more that we automate, the more that we integrate, the more that we, you know, apply bots and, and AI and other things, the, the less that payroll is about data entry and the more it becomes this higher level skill where you have to be able to do some very complex problem solving just by virtue of all the compliance and all the different rules and, and uh, processes that apply. And that just elevates the role even right out of the gate, right? I agree. And I'm, I'm curious to see where this will go because at some point, even with all the, the automation, somebody needs to enter it somewhere. And, you know, payroll is all about controls. And what I've seen across my career is that, not every department has the same focus on controls. They just enter it or they just change it and then it's out of their sight and payroll will clean up the mess. And I think that's where our biggest challenge is and where our biggest challenge will be for the future is help to educate others to understand their impact and to do it right the first time. Amen. Can I hear an amen? <laughs> <laughs> well said. I mean, I mean, payroll doesn't have a choice but to be perfect in most cases, right? I mean, ninety nine percent is it's to someone that's a problem, and so yeah, it's a it's a tough job, and they're in a tough situation, and I don't think that it's understood well enough still, and that's that's what we hope to change here with our our our, our work. <laughs> so anyway, so look, Emery, let, let's. Uh, I want to come back to what we were talking about, right? We talked about uh, the executive sort of. Um, partnership that you need or cultural alignment to payroll, helping payroll lift it up, right? How you, you wrote a great series, right? Which I was so happy to see you posting online that I turned into blogs with you and we're continuing to run those. So thank you so much for that series. And if anyone hasn't seen it, I'm going to be sharing links to this uh, here in the description. So please check that out. But in that series, we talked about payroll. You talk about payroll's sort of elusive seat at the table. And in that, you talked about, I, I, you know, in the very beginning about maybe, maybe you got to make your own table in a lot of ways. And so just want to talk about what inspired that POV, kind of how you're doing that and what, you know, what your tips are for, for folks sort of getting started in this way from that, from that perspective. Yeah. And the credit to the, to building my own table is not that I woke up one morning and I thought, oh, that's a great statement. I read somebody who was um, let go. And she wrote like, you know, I'm tired of, of trying to get a seat at the table. I'm going to build my own table. And, I, and that's when I'm like, oh, that's a fantastic statement to use for payroll and help people understand what that means. And then while I was thinking about that, I also realized like not everybody works for a big organization. Not everybody is senior, some are just starting their journey. So I wanted to write something that would help everybody who's not there yet to help them understand that there is, you know, walk before you can run, crawl before you can walk, like build it up, start somewhere, but tell your own story. Don't let others tell your story because that is the biggest mistake I think I made for a good couple of years in my career, I did allow others to tell my story. And it because of that, I, I did not give my team enough credit. I did not give myself enough credit, but also I didn't make it visible how important our work was, but also how bad, for example, our data was. So that's, that story, that sentence, like I'm going to build my own table, that for me is is my the biggest aha of 2023. Yeah, no, I'm I'm excited for you, Amory. That's why I want, <laughs> I want to stay so close to this journey, and I want to I want to share this with everyone because, th th to me, th th you know, we we use this analogy of building a table, but I think what we're saying is it's a set of skills. It's a set of 
right? And I think some of it is, and maybe Julie, I'd love to know what you think about this. I, it just sort of popped in my head. Has payroll maybe been been led too much and needs to now maybe lead a little bit more? And what I mean by that is, is payroll is a, is there to serve the organization without a doubt. I don't think anyone would would argue that. But in some ways, shouldn't payroll maybe be leading the organizations to the right answers and the right right with their exp- expertise and their guidance and their information and insights what what what's your thoughts on that julie and marie what do y'all think well so i um i think when i saw your blog and marie and really thought about it the first thing i thought is how the heck is that going to happen because hr has been saying for years it's our time to have a seat at the table and you know t- and to bring the value to the c suite uh, that hr hasn't often had and it, and my first thinking as you were describing, you know, making a seat at the table or making the table is, man, how, how is that going to happen if, if HR, you know, maybe has had some shreds of success, but let's say HR is, is aiming for a seat at the table. How do, how, what, what is it about payroll that gives it, you know, as much or better of a chance of being that partner with, uh, a strategic seat. And and the one thing that stood out to me just glaringly is the fact that payroll has such a broad network of stakeholders. I mean, really vested key stakeholders and so much so that it doesn't always sit in HR or in finance clearly or in operations or in shared services or, you know, at any particular place. And so it made me wonder if maybe that was that, that challenge, something that's always been a challenge might actually um, be an advantage uh, when you start thinking about um, making the table for payroll. Yeah. Well, and how I look at it as well is like define your table. If the success of my table is that I sit with the CEO every couple of months, that is not going to happen. And I also don't think that is what I'm aiming for. What I want my table to be is I want to be a respected leader that influence other leaders. Together, we make things, processes, experiences better. I want my my boss to sit at my table and his boss to sit at my table. And I want to be able to tell my story, show my data and get their support to make things better. Now, I'm kind of lucky between air quotes because we have um, a very strong audit team at SMP and they get focused like they focus on everything and I share a lot of our journey with them and because of that I got like an executive not CEO and CFO level but right below I have a few leaders that I meet with every month and I go through our payroll journey but I'm also very transparent like We share our projects, we share our metrics, we share where we failed, we share where others had opportunities to improve. Like there's no hiding because you can't tell your story if you exclude yourself or you hide stuff. But like my goal has never been to sit at the same table as the highest people in the organization. I want my table to be where people sit who can help me make things better. That's beautiful advice. Yeah. It, it, you got to be reasonable, right? As what I think you're saying. And just the fact that you're having that dialogue at that level, that kind of a dialogue is, is there's payroll operations that have never experienced that. I mean, never. And that's unfortunate because that's really what it needs to be as a norm. But let me challenge that. Like, why could you not have your own table? Like if yeah. you start your capturing your journey, you start putting metrics together, you start documenting what projects you work on. You can start really small and just sharing that with your boss and he or she may share that with their boss and you share that with your partner in accounting that you work with and your finance controller and you share it with your treasury team. That could be a start of the journey as well. Now, if you run payroll for a company that has 15 people, I agree that that journey is different. You can't compare that to like a big company, but I'm convinced that every payroll team has a story to tell and we should move away from making our success dependent of you have a seat at the, at the executive highest executive level, make your success 
reasonable, meaning make your success depending on the influence you can have with your peers or other leaders. And then at some point, your visibility and the credit will come your way. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I build, if you build it, they will come. I mean, and yeah. Julie, you, I, I would love to get your point of view here. I, I've, I've experienced that, right, where I've been in or, or advised shared service organizations where no one believed. And we started having, you know, review uh, metric reviews, KPI reviews of folks and slowly went from two yeah. executives to four executives to 10 executives. And before we knew it, we had a real audience that was looking forward to those conversations. So yeah, if you build it, they will come. I'm, I'm snickering over here because I'm thinking, you know, yeah. instead of the elite elitist party where you're striving, <laughs> striving to be at the C-suite table, you know, um, with the stakeholders and the impact that payroll has, you know, you could be the life of the party. You could be the party to go to, right? Where, I mean, yeah, like you're exactly. bound to have more stakeholders and more touch points of influence than many other domains in the organization. Yeah. yeah w- one of my trips actually led me to another like vision, like building your table, but then you can think about like this goes back. We, we were in India and there was a discussion on what was a good wine pour in your glass. And depending on who you ask, the the answer was different. And that made me realize, like, if you measure success, you know, success means something different for everybody that you talk to. So who decides if a glass is poured right or wrong? And that's you. You as, as the payroll person, you decide if your glass is half full or half empty. And you should always think that your glass it should be half full because you're changing the direction you're working to get people paid. Like it's so easy to look at a glass half empty because you're not getting the appreciation or people don't think of you, your department as getting it the importance that it deserves, but then start to tell your own story. I keep coming back to that. Start leading the way. There's nothing, nobody will laugh at you if you come to to your boss or to your peers and say, hey, look at my metrics. Let's see how we can change that together. Even if you do that, that is such a big step forward from doing nothing. I've never worked for a, for an executive leader that said, please don't give me metrics. I, I really don't <laughs> want to see that. <laughs> if anything, they were always like, can you come with more data around this next time? It's like, I was never enough, right? So right. I love that. And and look, your series is great because I think you broke it down, right? You started there yeah. with like, okay, what are we talking about when we're talking about a table? And I think this is beautiful uh, advice, right? It's not going to look the same for everyone. Make your own, start telling that story. So how do you, you know, in your second um, uh, blog, you gave a little bit of a roadmap. Do you want to talk about that here? I, I'd love to, I'd love for you to just sort of share the high points of that. Sure. So when I started thinking about how do I write it down? Like I I had to break it down because there's so much to share and it's easy for people to get overwhelmed. So how I started, I started just capturing data and we had really a lot of discussions within the team, like, well, that's not enough and it's not good enough and it's not hundred percent. I didn't care. I think if you, we started with capturing what we could capture. And at the beginning, people were kind of scared. And I've seen that in any organization I work for. If you ask people to start reporting, it's easy for people to think that you do that because you are monitoring their performance. But that is not what this is about. This is about showing where we are in our payroll journey. And the first couple of months, our metrics were fantastic. But they were fantastic because I think people were not comfortable enough yet. And, but also learning on what should be reported. What is a defect? Because at the beginning, a lot of people said, well, it's not the payroll error. So I don't write it down as a defect. I'm like, I don't care. Every time we pay people incorrectly, we write it down. We put in what is the root cause? How many people were impacted? And then like five, six months in, you could see that we started to true up and we still are are running a really good payroll. I don't want to take any credit away from that, but the pink bubble is a little bit gone. And what is interesting is while we started to report out, people start 
still looked at it and go like, oh my God, many mistakes and pay. Well, what are you going to do about it? So then we broke it down and said, you know, what is in our sphere of control? Like, what are the errors that we're making? What are the errors that others are making upstream that we can help them understand the impact, help them educate? And we sh we showed that 65 to 75% of the errors are outside of our sphere of controls. And we share the deck every month. So we share it with the complete payable team. And then we have an executive deck because the executives don't go through 16 slides. We have two or three slides and they really look at it. And, you know, recently one of them came back and said, listen, thank you. I never had such transparency about payable. And it, it really gives me a lot of trust knowing that you're leading it and that you're looking at these things. And I think that was the best present I had for the whole year is to get the confirmation that people understood our journey and people also realize that we're not perfect, but they trust us and they trust me as a leader as well. But, you, you know, I could have waited till I think everything was perfect, but that's not what our story is about. Like, I want to tell my own story. I want to make sure that people understand that there's more to it than just pressing a button. And I, Pete, you, Pete, mentioned that, like, there's there's a whole range of data that comes from somebody else, even sometimes from external bodies, like a, a text code, where you have no influence, and it's helped people understand what your journey is. And just start. That is the best advice I can give. Just start. Start small. Even if it's not perfect, you have an opportunity to make it better as you go. Like when you yeah. were born, you were not perfect. You're still not perfect. But as you grow, as you age, you get wiser and you learn more. And that's how you should look at this too. No, it's a beautiful story. And I, I I'm, you know, congratulations, Sam Marie. It's, it's so great to hear that you've got that progress. And one of the things I remember that you pointed out in your, in your blog was just, and, and I thought this was so smart. I, I feel like, um, that there's, we almost get too wrapped up in, like you said, trying to be perfect, trying to have everything. And you said, you know, just start with one or maybe even just two data points that are most important to your leader specifically, your, your immediate leaders, right? I think that's how you described it. Is that, is that really how you've been able to move the needle or yeah. move the ball? So we started with defects, just yeah. how many people got paid incorrectly. Then we added pre-defects, which we defined as errors that we catch preventing somebody get paid incorrectly, but we spent time on correcting it. Then we added tickets and our resolution time. Then we added what was in our sphere of controls. Then we added the, the projects that we're actually doing in or that we're undertaking to make things better. We're in the process of harmonizing payroll vendors. So we're adding data elements. Like if you, compare payroll and what is in Workday, how many data elements are outside Workday. And we don't do that for the globe. We take it on a country by country approach, but it helps people understand how manual your world is. And there's so much more like this year, I really want to put in like, how much are the defects costing us? How much are the pre-defects costing us? How much hours are we saving with increased automation and integration? And I can go on and on. Like, but I need to make sure that we we go slow and that we we take a path that is credible and that is right. I'm not here to present 24 pages of data where half of this is like uninteresting. I need our data to be interesting and tell a story and I'm okay to take it slow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, it, it's kind of like, kind of like when you go to the gym, right? I mean, day one of the gym, you're not going to be the best athlete, you did the best version of yourself, right? It's, it's coming every day and making incremental progress, right? I think that's how, how to look at this is we start with one or two data points and we build and we learn and we, and we expand. Yeah. And that sounds like what you've, what you've accomplished. So congratulations. I love it. I love it. 
What, what about, uh, so look, I know you're, I know you've got more coming. I'm excited about that. I want to tease that a little bit, but what's the next installment, right? You've kind of got us sort of thinking differently now. Um, you know, your, your, your next one, your next blog was a roadmap. I know you've talked a good bit about, you know, what, where to, what to do with the data and how to get started, but what's, uh, what's in store for the next, next chapter. So, yeah. So it's not a lack of ideas. Like there's a lot of things that are going through my mind. So the next block is about strategy. And the reason I decided to write about that is for years, I thought that I was weak at strategy. I had no strategy. I looked up at other leaders and I was like, I wish I had that strategic vision. What I didn't realize is I was just doing it. I just didn't call it strategy. And I spent so much time letting myself feel less important than my peers who I thought had a fantastic strategic vision. I had that same vision. I just didn't call it like that. And I'm like, I wonder how many people are struggling with that same, you know, continue to step up the ladder, getting into leadership positions. I'm probably not the only one feeling that. So that's where my next block is about is like telling my story about strategy and help others understand that strategy is is depending on who and what and yeah. where i i don't know that the that hey, i'm not making excuses but i think you know the way the culture and the environment is and and the the lack of understanding for payroll i think helps or hurt, hurts that right it, it it lends that feeling that you can't be you shouldn't be thinking strategic you're just payroll right and that's where i think we have to change that mindset and have payroll beginning to carry itself differently and i think you've articulated beautifully what i was saying earlier about the about leading more right payroll's got to lead a little bit more and and lead their both themselves to the next you know the next level but they've also got to begin sort of carrying themselves as leaders and talking like advisors and showing their their insights and their expertise and that's where i think their data is going to unlock that for them yeah i think working working yeah. with the data too you learn ultimately you, you said at some point in time while we were chatting here that senior leadership isn't going to look at 64 pages of of details right so so that slow and steady approach and beginning to infuse data and growing your data set um, that gives you plenty of opportunities opportunity to look at how you present data for a different audience types internal you know team audience data is going to look different presentation is going to look very different than what you want to show and showcase for other leaders and and that's a great um, that's a great thing to learn as you're kind of growing and building the way you described yeah, and of course, we have our PDF for our, our executive leadership, but then we have our, our report for our payroll team. But, you know, I have a really smart guy in my team who who built this in Power BI. So the payroll, regional payroll leads and their teams, they can actually go in to Power BI and they have this interactive dashboard that they can just click on, like EMEA UK, and it just filters down UK. And... So that's our next challenge. Like we have the dashboard now. We started with that in May. So we have like eight months in. Now this year, I need the regional leads to start to take that data and look at the data on a on a weekly or a monthly basis. Look at your dashboard. Pick your top topic, your your most painful topic, even if it, it doesn't have the most defect, but what is the most painful and try to work with your team to resolve that pick one don't try to to boil the ocean take one project at a time but then if we chip away those one projects we're chipping away globally a lot of projects and then at some point we can look back and see what an amazing journey we have had so that's that's 2024 yeah are, are you guys at a point, Anne-Marie, where you're able to take your data? Are your, are your executives leveraging your payroll data in concert, say, with other data around the org to begin? Some of them, not yeah. everybody, but like our, our finance controllership team and our treasury team, I say yes. Some of That's the great. other leaders, not yet. And maybe it's also not in their wheelhouse, maybe. Yeah. But I know two of them are taking our data and do something with it. And that's great. What I did know, like when we started sharing 
Um, and I also, I took the opportunity, like when, when senior VPs get their teams together, you know, I got the opportunity to, to present at two of their, their, their summits and people had no idea and people come like, how can we help? And you don't always get that opportunity. And the fact that they're offering, how can we help is a big plus. And I, I give credits for everybody stepping up and helping because this is more than just a paywall effort, but if I would not have had the data, if I would not have told my own story, nobody would have known. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, congratulations, Amory. It's so refreshing to hear leaders that have this right opportunity because I worry that some cultures and organizations just aren't matured there yet. Um, and wow, what what could what could be if you could take all of the data inside of an organization and work together with it in concert somehow yeah. if you one lens and be able to actualize that? I mean, the agility, the org agility is immense at that point. So. Congratulations to you and your org, and I, I'm excited. I, may, maybe you have to. Uh, we'd have to come back, and I'm certain we're gonna we're gonna have you on again for more combos. Um, and I'd love to just get an update with you. You know, maybe yeah. another you know another nine months or a year, and see what see what your journey is like. It's it's been really fun learning from you today. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah, this has been great. So, what's next for you, Emery? I know you've got a new blog coming out. We'll make sure we get links to that. But at what else? Where can we find you? What what you got coming up? So, 2024. So first year end close. Oh yeah. And then 2024, as I said, harmonizing payroll vendors. Um, I'm taking a, a short break um, to visit my family in the Netherlands in January. I'm very for much you. looking forward to that. Um, and I'm, I just started a new um, course that I'm in week two, which is executive presence, which is interesting because I need to film myself is <laughs> it's, it's very I uncomfortable but very very nice um, but I'm what I'm really looking for is I, I have a beautiful team I have a really strong team it's like they all gel well together and I I'm just looking forward to see what 2024 brings us it's going to be hard a lot of m and I expect we have our payroll vendor harmonization we have our regular paywalls to run um but it's going to be an exciting year and I, I'm, I can't wait to be at the end of 2024, look back and look at the amazing stuff that the team has done. Yeah, I'm happy for you. I can't wait and I'm excited to help you tell your story. And, and I know we're going to try to bring more of your knowledge to, to bear in, in our blogs. And Amory, we should figure out a way to partner up and maybe turn this into a class somehow. Maybe we can make oh, it some sort of Oh, that would be cool. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, we should figure that out. I sometimes wonder why are we not part of an like a university education? I know, I know. We need to teach payroll. We need to recruit for yeah. payroll. We need to we need to preserve it. So no, I'm I'm with you. Let's uh let's champion that. <laughs> and we, after we solve uh, a couple other problems, we'll we'll jump on yeah. that <laughs> as well. But no, you're you're absolutely right. We need more mainstream education around this. I think especially for I think HR too, right? Let's start yeah start teaching some of this stuff and get people uh in into the profession at a much different lens and much different pathway than just sort of, uh, I, I came into payroll or HR because I needed a job. Right. <laughs> so I, I love the idea of you of, of let's put a class together on yeah. like everything, but like processing payroll, but what do you need as a leader? Yeah. I think that would be great. How do you be a payroll executive? You're a payroll yeah, executive, exactly. Amory. We got to teach people how to do that. So we'll figure it out uh, together, but, uh, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate you. And Julie, what do you, uh, what do you have coming up? Oh my, uh, you know, it's a time of year when folks are, um, uh, get busy, as you mentioned with payroll. I do a lot of client work at this time and actually a lot of client, um, projections, right? Folks that are just trying to figure out what do I yeah. need to do in 2024 and how do I need to get there? Uh, actually need to back into timelines and, and might realize that, uh, they need to get started more quickly than they thought. Uh, so I have a lot of those types of conversations with clients and prospects at this time of year. And, you know, I love the client work because it just gives me a, a multitude of lenses. So I'll spare you, you know, the upcoming conferences and yeah. so forth, because we always talk about those and just say I'm deep into client and prospects and helping folks get ready to start a year fresh with uh, some big transformation activities, uh, probably just like the ones that Anne-Marie is looking forward to. 
Yeah, awesome, man. So I think it's going to be an exciting year, uh, 2024. It's already already kicking up busy. So um, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a fun one. What have you planned? What do I have planned? Well, let's see. Uh, January, I, I'm going to be heading over to London for ADP Rethink. That's their multinational yep. event at the end of the month. Um, I've got a new ebook coming with uh, Ramco. I've just finalized and uh, authored with them on AI and payroll. And uh, I, I just uh, confirmed a payroll masterclass I'm doing with iSolved on sort of the future of payroll and the future of the, pre- the role in the profession nice. uh, in February. So I'm excited about those three things personally. And um, yeah, just going to be here on HR and payroll 2.0 to help and tell stories like yours, Anne-Marie. And um, yeah, getting excited for 2024. Great. I think this is going to be our, this is our inspiration episode for folks in payroll that just want to know that there's a path. <laughs> so, yes yes there's hope there's light at the end of the tunnel you can do this and that's what i want people to know there are real life stories of this there's plenty of them um and i'm happy to try and try and amplify them so um yeah thank you so much amory really appreciate you thank you for having me yeah happy new year to everyone happy new year happy new year